Join me, if you will, in the word I'm reading out of the King James this morning. The King James should be on the overheads with us if you want to follow along in that way. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Congratulations, we've done one verse, already three things that we want to see. Amen? At least three. First of all, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Paul says, I didn't appoint myself to be an apostle. The men around me didn't appoint me to be an apostle. Jesus Christ made me an apostle. And as we read some and talked about some last week in Galatians, we explored the very real interaction there was between the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul himself, that, that it was direct revelation, direct impartation from Jesus Christ to Paul that gives Paul the wisdom with which he teaches and it made him an apostle. The disciples chose Matthias to be the twelfth disciple. Matthias, you don't know Matthias because he didn't do nothing that we have recorded in the Bible. Amen? Paul wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament because he was Jesus' choice to be the twelfth disciple, the twelfth apostle. So, now, this letter says to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. It would be very easy if it just said to the saints which are in Ephesus, we could read it. If we found some things we didn't like, we could go, well, you know, I don't really like that, but you know what, it was probably just relevant to the people in Ephesus. It doesn't actually pertain to us. But it doesn't say that. It says to the faithful in Christ Jesus, which means that if we name the name of Christ, if we are a Christian, whether it was 2,000 years ago in the way or whether it is right here today, this letter is to us. If we consider ourselves faithful in Christ Jesus, what is written in the letter of Ephesians was written to us. It is widely held and believed that Paul probably wrote the letter to the Ephesians, the letter called Ephesians, the letter to the church at Ephesus. It is widely held and believed that he wrote that letter while he was in prison in Rome. He probably was, was literally physically incarcerated. He probably was in a very physically challenging place. He was also at a place where he was very reliant on the Spirit and was very deep in the Spirit. And, and Ephesians is this magnificent letter. It, it goes beyond the operation of the church that we see so much in Corinthians and elsewhere. It goes beyond the, the pastoral epistles that we see in Timothy and Titus. It goes beyond church doctrine and issue. And this is literally, I, I mean, it's like, it's like life in the Spirit. It's like living in God. It's, it's, it's how we live day in and day out. And it says to us, to the church in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. It's also believed that probably this letter did go to the church at Ephesus, but this letter probably was circulated throughout Asia and sent to most of the churches. Some have even said that perhaps there was a blank space put in there, that it was sent to the church in Ephesus, but there was a blank place where the different churches would insert their names, or there was an understanding that the different churches were to insert their names, that this was a, a widespread letter to the different churches. It was relevant to them then, that day, and it is relevant to us today. Amen. So let us read the letter that the Holy Spirit gave through the hand of Paul to you and me. Amen? Amen? It says, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Expositional Bible teaching. You could read that and just skip right over it. But there's a word there which stands out. In. In Christ Jesus. This is a fundamental distinctive of our Christian faith. It does not say the faithful who follow Christ Jesus. It says in the specific original Greek language, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. You do not hear someone say, I am in Buddha. They may say, I follow the teachings of Buddha. They may even say they follow Buddha, which is kind of strange because Buddha's dead in a hole in the ground, and so you're following someone who's dead in a hole in the ground into a hole in the ground and be dead. But hey, it's your choice. But you don't hear someone say, I'm in Buddha. They might say, I'm following the teachings of Buddha. You don't hear someone say, I'm in Muhammad or I'm in Allah. They may be following the teachings of Muhammad. They may be following the teachings of Allah. You don't hear somebody say, I'm in the Dalai Lama or I'm in the Hare Krishna. This is a monumental thing. I know it's one little word, in, but it's a monumental thing. It's what distinguishes the Christian faith from all other faiths. 
It's why all of hell is arrayed and opposed against the Christian faith. It's why in your public school systems now it seems okay to practice every possible religion and acknowledge every possible holiday except for the Christian holidays. Because Christ is the only one that said, you will be in me and I will be in you. You see, our Christian existence is one of existing in God and God existing in us. It is an intimate relationship that is different and distinctive from every other faith, every other opportunity that the world offers. There is no other place in which we gay engage in a living relationship with a living God, a God who speaks, a God who hears, a God who is, and a God who says, your life will be in me, and my life will be in you. Hallelujah. This is an intimacy that is unprecedented and will never be repeated, never duplicated. It cannot be. There is only one who can do such a thing. Amen. And that is the true and living God. Amen. And His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I know this just sounds like a simple little greeting. What's the big deal? Well, we've already explored the, 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 the commentary on the Apostle Paul. We've explored the fact that it was to us today and the fact that we are in Christ. We've got three distinctives from the first verse. But now I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking cap. Okay? This is where it gets really cool. And this is what I said a moment ago. It's the difference between reading the Word of God and actually studying the Word of God. Let's look at these scriptures closely. Amen? It says, grace to you. You notice the word be is in, is in brackets? There's a reason for that. You see, the scripture was originally written in the Greek language. And it was translated into English. It was translated into English in about the 1600s. Most notably, the King James Bible we have. And it was translated by an Anglican church. An Anglican church that already had certain doctrines and teachings established. And so when they translated the Bible from Greek to English, they did it with a predisposed understanding of what the Word should say according to their Anglican faith. They also did it with a predisposition to how the English language should flow. So, the text actually reads the original Greek, grace to you. But, to make it more comfortable in English, they added be. The translators added the word be, grace be to you. The be does not exist in the original Greek. Why is that a big deal? Well, it's not in that phrase, but it becomes a pretty big deal in the next phrase. Let's read on. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, comma, and from the Lord Jesus Christ is what we read in English. Kind of curious. Did Paul have a problem with the Trinity? Why does he not mention the Holy Ghost? In fact, if you start to read the Pauline epistles, you will notice both in the greeting and the conclusion of most of the Pauline epistles, he says, God the Father, in the English, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's an absence of the Holy Spirit. Did Paul have a problem with the Trinity? Or maybe he just had an issue with the Holy Ghost? I doubt he had an issue with the Holy Ghost, since most of his epistles, including the letter of Ephesians, goes on and on and on about the Holy Ghost. And he talks about it in Galatians. In fact, he talks about in Galatians, he says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God's own Son sent into our hearts. Amen. Paul acknowledges that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ dwelling in us. Amen. See, I don't think Paul had a problem with the Trinity at all. I think Paul had a true understanding of the Trinity. Paul understood that there is one God. There's a plurality of one God, but there is not a plurality of gods. There's a plurality of one God. One God who exists in a plural nature that by some has been labeled the Trinity and that Trinity has been misshapen into believing that there may be three different people as if there were three different thrones in the kingdom of heaven. Or there was three different individuals with which we interact. There is one God and His name is Jesus Christ. He exists in a plurality and there's a ways that we know Him and His Spirit moves among us. He is the Father of creation. The Scripture tells us that through Him, by Him, in Him, and for Him were all things created. Nothing was created that was created without Him. Amen. I don't know about you, but that sounds like fathership to me. Amen. Yes. Amen? We are born again in Christ Jesus. Yes. That means He is our Father. We are birthed through Him. Yes. 
So now check this out when we read this. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The word from is in brackets again, which means what? It was added by the English translators. The word from does not exist in the original Greek text, which means that if we read the text from God our Father and... The word Lord means master. The Lord is one word in Greek. It's master, meaning owner. One to whom one belongs. That's the most literal translation of the word the Lord. It means the one to whom you belong. Okay? So if we read it now in English with the punctuation there, it says grace to you and peace from God our Father and our owner, our master, our possessor, Jesus Christ. The problem is, there's actually no punctuation in the Greek language. The comma, just like the word from, was added by the Bible translators. What would happen if we came from a different perspective and said Jesus Christ is Lord, and we moved the comma a couple of spaces down and we read the text, from God our Father and Master, comma, Jesus Christ. Or how about if we just did away with all the commas and we said, from God our Father and Master, Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you what you've got to believe, but I am describing to you specifically what the text says and encouraging you, if you don't acknowledge the deity of Jesus Christ, if you do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, I'm encouraging you to take a look at the scriptures. Take a look at the Bible. Start to really look at it with an open heart and an open mind and realize that, it, and, and listen, we're not trying to discount the reality of the Trinity. Okay? We're not trying to discount the plurality of, of Jesus Christ. We're not trying to discount the plurality of God. But there's not multiple individuals running around in the heavens. Amen. There's one God. Yes. And His name is Jesus Christ. And why is that important? Because when life gets ugly, when life gets hard, when this world comes against you, or the circumstances of this world get, and you want to exert the influence and the power of heaven, to change your circumstances. If you don't know who your God is, it's hard to ask Him for help. Come on, somebody. They're, 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 if you know His name, you call Him by name. Believe me, you, you, know, you could say, hey, I know somebody at work, but you don't know their name? Or hey, let's, let's do it one better. Everybody's been to church with somebody you didn't know their name. Amen? You sat with them on Sundays, but you didn't know their name. I mean, you say, I know them. Yeah, I know who that is. They, they usually sit in that back, that, that row, on that end seat. I don't know their name, but, you know, they, they normally come in about two minutes late, and they sit in that one chair, and, 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 and they seem real nice. they got a nice smile. You know who I'm talking about, right? I don't know their name. Okay, you know them, but you don't really know them. You say, hey, I know God. I don't really know his name, but, but you know, I know God. I, I know God exists. Yeah, well, you ain't on a first-name basis with him. When you're on a first-name basis with somebody... You know, you, you show up at somebody's house and knock on their door and tell them you're there for lunch and you don't know their name? <laughs> they, they may not be too excited to see you. In fact, they may not even invite you in. But you show up at somebody's house and you know their name and you knock on their door and say, Hey, it's good to see you, man. I've been thinking about you. I've been missing you. Got a couple minutes? They're a lot more likely to invite you in. Amen? When life comes to get ugly and, and, and you want to bring the power of God to your situation, it's really nice to know what His name is. Amen? And Jesus Christ is the true and living God. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You know, this means exactly what it says. Who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The word heavenly places meaning the things in the heavenly realm. Literally the things that are in God's heaven. Who has blessed us with all things? I know there's a religious temptation to believe that we are striving to obtain. But God says by His word in Christ Jesus that we are not supposed to be struggling through this life to get to heaven when we can finally get our reward. It says that everything in the spiritual realm of heaven has been bestowed upon us now. Amen? Amen. Amen? Including a heavenly language. Come on, somebody. Let's get a little Pentecostal for a moment. The ability to fellowship with God. The, the ability for 
power, miracles, prayer to affect things in this earth. You know, in and of itself, we could question that, but when you start to put other scriptures with it, when you come into the 14th chapter of John and about the 12th verse, and Jesus says, greater things than these will you do? Jesus says, you will do the works that I have done and greater still. Greater meaning more numerous. Not meaning greater in magnitude. I don't know what we're going to do greater than he did in magnitude. He raised the dead, he healed the lame, cured the leper. I mean, he pretty much did it all. But he was in one flesh body when he was doing it. He died on a cross and ascended into heaven that His Spirit be poured out into all flesh, that the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God's own Son, come to dwell in our hearts, that by that we may cry out, Abba, Father, adopted sons and daughters, heirs of the kingdom, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, that we may conduct His business. Literally, the most literal translation is that through us He continues His work on the earth. Amen. There was never any... I'm thoroughly convinced by the Scriptures, there was never any expectation or intention for Jesus Christ to do anything other than to continue the exact same ministry He had on this earth, but instead of doing it through one fleshly earthen vessel, He wanted to do it through millions of fleshly earthen vessels. He multiplied His presence yes. across the face of the earth. That literally, that you and I be the vessels through which the person of Christ goes to the world. To reach and to teach, to touch, to love, to help, to heal, to bless, to minister. We are to literally minister with His efficiency, His proficiency, His power, His unction. And every time we embrace the things of this world, every time we, we surrender, we buy, every, everything in this world is designed to have us do something other than that. To have us be less than Christ to this world. To distract us from the purpose and the calling of being Christ to this world. To have us be something other than gentle, patient, kind. To have us be something other than powerful and blessed. It says that He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Now that's important at that present level, but it's also going to be present if we get there today a few verses from now. So just remember that. Bookmark that. Amen? Coming back to it. Verse 4. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. You know, we sometimes get excited. You, you, you hear me preach a lot, especially lately, that that God had a purpose for you. That, that, that he, he, he called you from before the foundation of the world. That He called you before He created you. That literally every person is so uniquely created. As we've said many times before, even identical twins have different fingerprints, different footprints. Yes. No two human beings have ever been created the same. Even identical twins that share the same DNA have different fingerprints, different footprints. They're not identical, even though they're called identical. Even though they share the same DNA. God has created every person on this earth for a unique and precious purpose. One of the reasons that, that, that abortion is such an absolute travesty. Because it literally assassinates in the womb God's purpose, God's life. It's not just an adorable little baby. It is God's life, God's purpose being birthed into the earth. And that purpose is aborted before it ever sees daylight. We're not just aborting children. We're aborting life and we're aborting purpose in God. And we're voting for people that do it. And we're permitting it. And we're funding it. And we're permitting it to happen and turning our faces and turning our backs and ignoring it. We are letting the enemy snuff out God's purpose in the womb and not defending it. Likely, likely we've aborted the cure for AIDS. Likely we've aborted the cure for cancers. Likely we've aborted scientists who would find a healthy way to increase crop production and feed the world. God makes provision for every need, for every soul on this earth. If something is lacking, it's because man has gotten in the way. 
we've probably extinguished the life that was the carrier of what God had, that solution for that problem. Imagine if Mary had said to Joseph, Joseph, I don't want to bring shame on the family. Maybe we should just get rid of this baby before we get married, before anybody knows, before I start the show. Imagine if Mary had aborted Jesus. Whoa. Every child that is born into the earth comes into the earth with the same purpose, significance, and value as Jesus Christ. You may debate that, but you debate it with God when you stand before Him. Every one of us. And you know, we, we preach that and we love to cheer about that because it makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside. We think maybe preachers just trying to send us out on a good note so we'll come back to church next Sunday. No, it's because God's Word says He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Literally before He even created the foundations of this world. He, he saw us and chose us to be His beloved. He made a covenant. He made a way of escape. He made a way that we could become His adopted sons and daughters before He ever created the earth. How vast, how immense, how loving, how grace-filled is our God. He created a solution to the problem before the source of the problem even existed. I don't know if you're a good problem solver, but that's pretty good problem solving. When you solve a problem, it doesn't even exist yet. Praise God. This is the love, the capacity with which He loves us. This is uniqueness and a specialness. And we read that and we feel good and then we read verse 5 and we really stumble. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. I'm going to hit something and then come back. Notice it says, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. When you start reading this, the farther you read into these paragraphs, it gets really unclear whether we're talking about Father God or Father Jesus, unless they be the same, and then we kind of understand that maybe it makes a little more sense. Yes. Having predestined us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. God predestinated. So, they're right. There is predestination. Some of us are going to heaven and some of us are not. It's decided before we're born. No, it's not what the Scripture says. Listen, I'm not here to knock anybody today. and Not to knock any denominations or faith. But let's take the word at what it says, okay? This is one of, from, from my perspective, one of the most unfortunate misdoctrinal understanding thought processes. This whole notion of predestination. Predestination, if you don't know, is a, is, a, is a reportedly Christian doctrine that says that some people are predestined in God to be saved no matter what they do, and some people are outside of predestination, which means they never can be saved. Because a few places here in Ephesians, some place in Romans, some place else, it talks about being predestinated or predestined. Notice what it says. It says, predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. Mm. First thing, predestination does not exist outside of Christ. So unless you are in Christ, you cannot be predestinated. Now, predestinated or predestination means a desire, a choosing. Have you ever desired... Have you ever predestined that after church you were going to go get some ice cream and then you got there and the ice cream shop was closed? Amen? You desired it, you intended it, it was your plan. But it doesn't always work out that way. You see, in order to embrace the doctrine of predestination, you have to, from my perspective, discard the doctrine of free will. Free will and predestination cannot coexist. Because if predestination says that you're destined to be saved no matter what choice you make, then you don't have free will. And if predestination says you can't be saved no matter what choice you make, then you don't have free will. Aside from which, it's really hard to reconcile some scriptures such as, For God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, which is in the Greek, whosoever should call upon His name should not perish but have eternal life. We, I, 
don't know how we can embrace something doctrinally that sits in direct opposition to certain aspects of the Scripture. The Scripture tells us that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, it literally, clearly states that whomsoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do you reconcile that with the predestination that says only some will be saved and no matter what they do and others won't? Okay. Predestination means that God desired before earth that we'd be saved. All of us would. And the scripture tells us that clearly. That it's his desire that none should perish. But, but here's what it really means. And, and for me, I think the easiest way to understand predestination Predestination is for a group of individuals, not for an individual. And that's where the doctrine, I believe, where the doctrine of predestination gets off the tracks. Because they have taken a corporate concept, a, a, a concept for a group of people, and applied it to an individual. Okay? The, the, the doctrine of predestination as a religious doctrine says that individuals have been predestinated, or predestined to be saved or not saved. That's not the case. What has been predestinated is that a group of people will be saved and a group of people will not be saved. And it wasn't actually predestined that they wouldn't be saved, but it was predestined that those that are in Christ would be saved. And it's not even really predestined because it's not God's desire, but it's just the reality of the matter. Those outside of Christ will not be saved. It is, as much as we may want them to, as much as hard as it is to believe that, as hard as it is to accept... And though it may sound cruel to some, the reality of the matter is those in Christ will be saved, those outside of Christ will not, based upon what the Scripture says. Let's make it simple, and then we'll move on. And we're going to brain cramp, right? It's as if there was a ship. There's a ship moving through the heavens, and the name of that ship is predestination, and the captain of that ship is Jesus Christ. That ship is predestined to enter a certain port. Okay? The ship of Jesus Christ, the ark, come on somebody, I'm preaching better than you're letting on. The ark, whose captain is Jesus Christ, is predestined to arrive with its inhabitants in the New Jerusalem. Those that have chosen to get on that ark fall into predestination and will arrive in Christ Jesus in that new Jerusalem. There is no predestination does not exist outside of Christ Jesus, which is why it says He has predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. That is such a weak translation in English. There's only one word I want you to really grab today out of that verse. Accepted. If you've been accepted to college, it means you got in, right? Amen. You may have been the last one they chose. Amen. You may have barely gotten in. You may have smiled at just the right time. They may not have had enough people to fill the class, and they just needed one more, and they picked you. You got accepted even though you really didn't qualify. That's what we sometimes think of when we say accepted. Amen? They accepted me at the church. I don't think they really like me. Nobody talks to me, but they seem to accept me. Or, you know, those people accepted me, but I don't really feel like I belong. Accepted in the English language means one thing to us. Let me tell you what this word means in the Greek language. When it says accepted in the beloved, it means highly favored. Amen. Amen? It means compassed about with favor. Do you know what compassed? Compassed about means you are surrounded with God's favor. It means highly blessed. It means honor. It means lovely. It means that you've been made lovely. You've been highly blessed, highly honored. It literally means endued or endowed with grace. You have been made gracious. Literally like as if grace was a liquid that was just all over you. You're just, I'm just grace. Just overflowing grace. I'm grace. It's just like you, you to grace jello. 
You're highly endued. You're surrounded with God's favor. You're filled overflowing with His... I like that translation better, amen? amen? That's what it literally says. In the original language, it says, To the praise and glory of His grace, wherewith He made us highly favored, filled with His grace, surrounded with His favor. He made us lovely. He made us blessed all in Christ. Now that makes us want to worship. Amen? amen? Come on. That makes you want to shout and worship. That is, that is way better than accepted. Amen. <laughs> Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood. Why are y'all singing about the blood so much? Pentecostals, all they want to do is sing about the blood. All people want to do is talk about the blood. Don't they know blood's offensive? Yeah, it's offensive to sin. It's offensive to darkness. The reason we sing about the blood, the reason we preach about the blood, the reason we pray about the blood is because our redemption is through His blood in whom we have redemption through the blood. What does the redemption bring us? The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Not according to our work, not according to our religious effort, not according to how good we were on any given day of the week. Amen. According to His grace, His free gift. Yes. The free gift of God's grace. Literally the free gift of accepting us who were not worthy to be accepted. Now, I know I'm not preaching to any of you. I'm talking about myself and some other people that go to another church. But they weren't, and I wasn't worthy to be accepted into His kingdom. Y'all upright, clean living folk, never done anything wrong. I know. But, but weren't worthy. But yet, while we were fornicators, drunkards, revilers, liars, adulterous, rebellious... Yet, while we were in that place, yet while we were worshiping other gods, mm -hmm. He stretched forth His hands you, upon a cross Amen. and gave His life that through His blood we may be redeemed, literally translated out of the darkness and into the kingdom of His dear Son. Literally translated out of the darkness of hell, sin, and Satan and translated into the kingdom of life. The Father God, Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost overflowing the fullness. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Hallelujah. Including physical healing, speaking in Amen. tongues. Come on, somebody. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the same Amen. yesterday, today, yes, Lord. forever. Yes. I wonder why he said, Pastor Debbie, I wonder why he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why didn't he say you shall have no other gods before us? He said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And if we are partakers of that Abrahamic covenant, if we really are what the rest of this book tells us, one man, we are neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Greek but we are one man in Christ. And we are partakers of that Abrahamic covenant. Which means we are partakers of that promise to the one God of Israel. Who is the one God of the Gentiles. His name is Jehovah, which is Jesus. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, Wherein He has abounded toward us all wisdom and prudence. No, prudence is not a prude. Relax. Prudence means knowledge. We don't use that word too much anymore. When you read it in our modern English, just read, He has abounded toward us all wisdom and knowledge. He's given us every spiritual blessing in the spiritual realm. He's given us all knowledge and all wisdom. It is at our disposal. I don't know what I should do with my life. Really, when's the last time you asked the Holy Ghost? I don't know whether I should let my kid go do this. Really, did you ask the Holy Ghost? I don't know whether I should go to this school or that school. Did you ask the Holy Ghost? I don't know what, what class I should take, what my major should be. Did you ask the Holy Ghost? I don't know if I should take this job. Did you ask the Holy Ghost? Now, here we go. We're going to mess up somebody's world. I think I'm going to marry this person. Did you ask the Holy Ghost? 
No, I don't need to. We're perfect for each other. They're just wonderful, really. <laughs> Holy Ghost is going to teach you something after you get married. Holy Ghost is going to teach you. You should have asked him before you got married. And you're going to find out pretty turns ugly after you marry. You didn't ask the Holy Ghost. You're going to find out sweet turns sour if you didn't ask the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Meaning that he gave us. The Holy Spirit is wisdom. Read the Proverbs. Read the Psalms. The Holy Ghost is the wisdom of God. And it's been given to us. It dwells in our hearts. We have a library of right and wrong, and most of us don't open the card catalog. We just keep doing things because it feels right. I can't figure out why we keep getting bit, burned, and stung. <laughs> Verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He has purposed in Himself. How many times have you heard people say, oh, I don't know what God's will is. Nobody knows what God's will is. You, you, come on. Everybody's been in church long enough to heard somebody say, well, nobody really knows what God's will is. Really? Because His Word says that He has made known unto us the mystery of His will. What is the mystery of His will? Christ in us, Christ through us. And, and it, it, it's elsewhere in the Scriptures. I mean, if, 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 if we expanded every verse of this to every other Scripture touches the Bible, I don't know if we'd ever get out of Ephesians 1 before the Lord came back. The mystery of God's will. The mystery that was hidden from ages past is Christ in us, revealed to the world. What, what, what they didn't see, what was purposely concealed in the Old Testament, in the prophets, what was purposely concealed was the mystery. They, they knew the Messiah was coming, but it was the mystery that the Messiah would dwell in them and through them. And in the Gentiles and through the Gentiles. There is a mystery within a mystery. There is a mystery that, that the Messiah, that Christ, the Savior, would dwell through us and, and be manifest to the world. But it also was a mystery because much of the audience at the time was Jewish. That it would be in the Gentiles and not just the Jews. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, that Christ be manifested in us to a dying and hurting world. Did Christ do in us greater works than He did even when He was here in a singular flesh? Verse 10. And here we go. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. Isn't it comforting to know it's also that the book of Ephesians talks about the rapture of the church, that it's not just found in Thessalonians and some other places. Amen? Amen. It, 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 I don't know about you, but if, it, it, if you can't see rapture in that statement, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, meaning when God says what needs to be done is done, God, Jesus, will gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. We read elsewhere about the rapture. It says that Jesus Christ comes with all the saints that are in heaven to gather all the saints who are on the earth. Now we can debate and argue about the timing of the rapture. That's fine. But you can't debate that the rapture is going to happen unless you want to dismiss multiple verses from multiple books of the Bible, which are in absolute and total agreement. The rapture, though the word rapture is not in, the word rapture is not in the English Bible. It's in other translations, Latin and such. But if you want to ignore the word rapture, you want to say Christ coming for His church, that's fine. You want to say the gathering together. How about that? Because the Bible talks about gathering together. It says that He will gather together all of those that are in Christ, both in heaven and in earth. Which makes it really hard for people who say that when you die, you sleep in the dirt until the end of the age. doesn't work that way because it says that the dead in Christ, those that are already in Christ, that are in heaven. Revelation tells us that. Elsewhere in the Bible it tells us it tells us to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. The moment that we die, we go into His presence. Now, whether we get to stay in His presence or not has a lot to do with the decisions we made in this life. But He's coming. And He's coming with those that are in Christ in heaven to collect those that are in the earth that are in Christ. All those that are in Christ will be gathered together. Amen. Notice what it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all, and it says things, 
but the brackets are missing because things is added. If you've got a good study Bible, those words that they added will be in italics, letting you know that they added it. It wasn't in the original Greek language. The original Greek language reads that in the fullness of times might gather together in one in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. The word things is not there. It literally just means that he will gather all. Amen? Amen. Meaning the peoples who are in Christ. There's the rapture in Ephesians. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. There's that word again. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We've been preaching in here. We've been preaching and we've been teaching in here and elsewhere that we are here for a purpose. That if we are positioned in His purpose, then His prosperity, His presence, and His peace will come to us. When we get positioned in His purpose, it's not because our name is something and we're great and special that God blesses us or we... The, world teaches us, the church church teaches us, even most of the church teaches us that if we're good religious folks, we'll have more blessings, and if we're not, we won't. We sometimes look at good Christians and their lives tore up, we can't figure out why, and then we look at some folks, not so good Christians, and they're blessed, upside down and backwards and forwards, and can't figure out why. Because it's not so much about our works, as it is about being in His purpose. If we are placed in His purpose, if we are fulfilling His purpose, Prosperity, peace, His protection comes in His presence. We get His presence when we get in His purpose, and in His presence, found fullness of joy. We find prosperity, protection, peace. Because we are positionally where we are supposed to be. Not because we prayed enough prayers, or we did enough right things, or we're good enough. Because... Basically, that doctrine says, well, if you're not living so good, you're, you're not blessed. And if you're living good, you're blessed. Which means we can look around the church and see the not blessed folks and know they're not living right. I told you. Let's go have coffee and talk about them. I know they're not living right because they got problems in their life. <laughs> you laugh. This is what most of our churches in America are built around. That's right. we, we know the people who are blessed are living good. The people who aren't blessed, they're doing wrong. It's a secret sin. I don't know what it is, but I know it's there because they they got trouble. And I'm not really concerned about living right. I just want to live more right than them. As long as I'm living better than some of the other folk, I'm more blessed than them, I'm, I'm good. I'm up on the church roster. It's all about church. It's all about us. It's all about appearances. It's all about judging between ourselves and others. Oh, the Scripture talks about, Scripture talks about His purposes. To the purpose of Him. To the purpose of God who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. I don't know about you, but I figured out by now, most of the time, he does what he wants to do, even if I haven't agreed with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had the same experience in your life. Maybe God just bows his knee and does everything you ask him to do. But it's been my experience that he only does what I want him to do when what he wants to do is what I wanted to do. But if what I wanted to do is not what he wants to do, we don't seem to do that. Amen. And if I have to do it, I have to do it on my own. And I don't seem real good at it without him. Just my experience, maybe. You've had a different experience. It's according to the purpose of His will. Hallelujah. In His purpose. Operating in His will. We see His glory manifested. I want to touch three more verses and then we'll, I think, knock off for today. We'll see how quick we get to the others. Verse 12. I'm going to read 12, 13, and 14 together, I think. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in who, you were, in who also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Actually, I'm going to read those two verses, then we'll come to 14. It's a little confusing in the King James so the modern translations make it a little easier to read. Let me, let me just summarize those two verses for you, okay? Paul's writing, and he knows that many of the recipients of the letter will be originally Jews by birth. They are Jews who converted to Christianity. Still widely accepted that the Jews 
are, were, and is God's original chosen messengers of His Word, the ones originally called to salvation. Abrahamic covenant, the promise originally given to the Israelites, to the Jews. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of glory who first trusted in Christ. Paul is a Jew. So when Paul says, as a Jew, to us who first trusted in Christ, he's saying, we, the Jews, who first received Christ because the message of Christ was first given to us. Verse 13, in whom you also trusted, meaning you who are not also Jews, meaning you Gentiles also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The message originally came to the Jews and through the Jews, but it was sent to the Jews and the Gentiles. But the Gentiles received it after the Jews. So Paul's saying, glory be to God for the Jews who first believed, but also to the Gentiles who came to faith afterwards. We've all been sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit. Okay? For the promise, because it's the same promise. That's what we said earlier. Okay? Scripture bears it out. It is the promise of what we call the Abrahamic covenant. The reality of the matter is it's a covenant that was made before the foundation of the world, that we would be in Christ, that we'd be redeemed, that we would be blessed, and that the nations would know God through Christ. So, when we as a Gentile, a Gentile is anyone not Jewish by natural birth. If you are Jewish by natural birth, you're a Jew. If not, you're a Gentile, whether you're Greek, American, American, English, <laughs> Turkish, whatever, you're a Gentile. Once, as Gentiles, we are born into Christ, we become partakers of that same covenant, that covenant that promised the land, Israel, as God's dwelling place. We as Gentiles are as responsible to defend and protect that land as are the Israeli people today. It is our responsibility as born-again Gentiles in Jesus Christ to protect and honor that land, that people, that the land not be divided, that Jerusalem not be divided, that, 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 that people, that that nation, we're as much a part of it as they are. I know that there may be some Jews that don't like that. There may be some Gentiles that are not comfortable with that. But the Scripture bears it out. We are neither white nor black, neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female. We are one in Christ. To the Jew and the Gentile, when the Scripture says two men become one, it means the Jew and the Gentile become one. As far as God's concerned, there is a partaker of the covenant, and there is not a partaker of the covenant. He's no longer concerned with your natural birthright. And that nation, that land, that heritage, all of the promises, everything in the Abrahamic covenant was to Jew and Gentile alike who believe in Christ. Amen. Every bit of the inheritance. And we are accountable and responsible before Christ. Just as the Jews were early charged with protecting and carrying God's word, now we become partakers of that covenant to protect and carry His word. To preserve the light and the darkness. To conquer. We are called, just as the early Israelites, to go into the land and eradicate the evil. But as we talked about some weeks ago, we don't do it now with natural swords. We do it with a sword of the Spirit, putting on the armor of God, casting down every vain imagination and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, breaking strongholds, tearing down walls. Yeah. The walls of Jericho came down in the natural, yeah. but we are to go into the spirit realm and pull down the strongholds that separate and isolate people from Christ and keep them bound and captive. Yeah. We are to set the captives free to proclaim liberty yes. to them that are bound. Amen. Blind eyes be opened, deaf ears may be made to hear. Yes. Oh, we concentrate on the physical miracles, but what a greater miracle when an eye that could not see the Word of God, the living Christ, can see all of a sudden Christ. Praise God when an ear that was once deaf to the love of God and the grace of God becomes open to the love and the grace and the presence of God. Yes. These are the walls of Jericho that must come down. Yes. Now, on the off chance that I haven't doctrinally stepped on somebody's toes today, let's make sure we get everybody else that's left with verse 14. What is the earnest of our inheritance? What is the earnest? We go back to verse 13. 
in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that, the text says that Holy Spirit, that is in italics again, it's not in the original language, ye were sealed with Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until, that word is in the Greek language, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. For those of you that are absolutely certain that once you were born again, you have the Holy Ghost, you can live any old way you want, do anything you want, it doesn't matter because once saved, always saved, everybody's always saved. I don't see this borne out in the Scriptures. Because the Scripture says that we have received the earnest. Earnest is a down payment, it is a deposit. Literally, it is a spiritual stamp, a brand, if you will, that says something belongs to someone. Amen? Amen. If, 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 if you, I don't know, you, whatever, you, you've got a, a, a textbook for school, you put your name in it, you brand it that that book is yours, that those that look on that book will know it's yours. Amen? Maybe, maybe... Maybe you have stuff and, and you've put a stamp on the bottom of it that says that it's yours. If you, if you have a cattle farm, you brand your cows that say they're your cows. It's earnest. It's a down payment. It's a deposit. The specific nature of the word earnest says that that deposit can be forfeited. It's extremely clear in the Greek language. The word earnest means in the Greek language what it means today for us in English. It means a deposit that is guaranteeing a future purchase. But how many know some people put money down to buy a house and they don't actually close on the house? And they lose their deposit. Some people put money down to buy a car and they start making payments. But before the car is paid off, before they own it, something happens. And they lose the car, and they lose their earnest, and they lose the money they've paid. Just because you've made a deposit on something does not mean that the deal is done. Hallelujah. And that is exactly what the scripture is saying. It's not what we're implying. It's not what we're manipulating it. When you go into the original language, what it literally says is a deposit, a down payment on your inheritance has been made. Amen. God gives us His Holy Spirit so that when we get born again, He gives us a deposit of His Holy Spirit that we will know a few things. One, we will know that indeed He is real. Amen. Two, we will know that we are born again. If there is not evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life, no matter how many times you've prayed the prayer or confessed the prayer, you need to be real concerned that scripturally you are not born again. You may say, I've done all the right things. I've filled out all the check marks. I've bought all the license plates, the t-shirts, the stickers. I've, I've, I've said all the prayers. If there's not evidence Amen. of the Holy Spirit in your life, you and the people around you have good reason to question whether you're really born again. And none of us should walk around questioning whether we're born again. We should be hit with the Holy Ghost in such a way that we got no doubt something happened. Amen. Amen. I don't know what happened at that meeting, but something happened. Amen. You may have fallen down. You may have gotten picked up. I, I don't know. You may have gotten quiet. You may have gotten loud. But something should have happened. There should be a deposit of the Holy Spirit. That is a deposit towards the inheritance. Now listen, I know what some people would say with this. Some people would teach and say, well what that means is that you've got a portion of the Holy Spirit because you don't have everything that you're going to get once you get to glory. Well here's the problem with that. Remember I told you earlier to bookmark something? What does it say in verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The Bible can't contradict itself. So when we understand that by exclusion, sometimes it's what it tells us, sometimes it's what it tells us can't be, we know that it can't mean that there is a, a portion of the giftings of the Holy Spirit, but there's more fullness to come. Because in verse 3 it tells us all the fullness is ours now. 
It's not like like we got a uh, we got a little bit of the Holy Spirit, but not enough to work a miracle. We got a little bit of the Holy Spirit, but not enough to speak in tongues. That that part's gone. No, because the Scripture says all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. Does that mean we've accessed them? Not necessarily. Not every individual, but they're there for the taking. Amen. They've been given. You can be given a Christmas present, but it could be June. It's still sitting under the sofa, under the tree. You haven't opened it. You've got the present, but you haven't opened it. You haven't played with it. You haven't used it. Amen? You may have got a cell phone for Christmas. It's July. It's still sitting under the sofa, wrapped in the box. You ain't made any phone calls. Not helping you a bit. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has been bestowed upon us, but some people say, well, I don't know. I don't want to open that package. I'm afraid of what might be in the box. It's from God. How can it be anything but good? God doesn't give bad gifts. If we, being evil in our hearts, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more our Father who's in heaven? I mean, when our children are desperate or hungry or hurting, we don't give them a stone or laugh at them. And we're evil in our hearts. We don't know how to be good parents. He who is a perfect father, how much more does he know how to give good gifts to his children? He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. So this earnest... It's a deposit. It's a down payment. Now, if we say that that deposit, that down payment can be forfeited, I think we ought to take just a moment quickly to clarify how it can be forfeited. Well, that's easy, preacher, if somebody sins. Really? So, if they smoke a cigarette, they're going to hell. Because that's a sin. And they had the Holy Spirit, but they sinned, and so now they're gone. Well, that's a little extreme. Maybe they just have to murder somebody or commit adultery. Yeah, that makes sense. If they commit adultery or commit murder, they're going to hell because they're not saved anymore. They forfeited their earnest. Their earnest. Earnest, whatever his name is. Okay. Well, under that line of reasoning, anybody who lies has for. Oh, wait, we got a lot more people in that group, didn't we? Not everybody's a murderer. At least not physically. They've done it in their heart. They've spoken evil against the brother. But... Pretty much everybody's lied at some point. So even you who were born again one time, you've lied, you're done. You're gone. <laughs> Sizzle. Toast. You're out of here. Too bad. In fact, every person who's ever sinned at any point in their life after they were born again is going to hell. It's going to be lonely in heaven. I hear Jesus now. Hello, 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 hello. Every one of us sins, even after we're born again. Apparently this religious doctrine thing's not working out. Um, must be another answer. We can forfeit the deposit. Apparently we can fall away because Peter talks about it. The whole book of Hebrews talks about it. But if sin causes us to fall away, then that means that sin is greater than the blood of Jesus. Doesn't it? If you commit... If you believe a religious doctrine that says you commit a sin and that causes you to lose your salvation, then what you've effectively said is that sin has more power than the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you may never have said those words, but that's what you said. It's what your religion spoke. And because that born-again believer sinned, they're lost now because that sin has more power than the blood of Jesus. We have people standing on platforms singing about the blood of Jesus the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and then somebody said that, oh, they're lost. Better get them to the altar and save them again. Yet we know people can fall away. They, they've got an earnest, and earnest deposits can be forfeited. Peter talks about falling away. The Bible talks about apostasy multiple times. Why would the Bible teach us about apostasy if apostasy couldn't happen? Why does the whole book of Hebrews talk about apostasy if apostasy is not possible? So what happens? This is my personal take on the matter. I think scripturally it's a pretty good one. The same heart, the same free will that chose Christ can choose out of Christ. And you say, well, what difference does it make if we sin then? Well, sin is a big deal. Because as Pastor Debbie has tried to teach over and over and over and over again, sin sears your heart. It sears your conscience. There's a reason they call it a falling away. Because we let a little language in. We let a little in through the eye gate. 
we partake of a little bit through the ear gate. Things that are kind of edgy, a little bit in the world, a little bit not in the kingdom of God, but it's okay because it's just little stuff. But it starts to sear the heart. Hallelujah. It starts to burn the heart and it, it literally starts to become hard. It starts to build up a callus or even a scab. And all of a sudden you wake up one day and there's such a thick covering over that heart. It's become so hard. Those ears have become so deaf. Those eyes have become so jaded by what they've seen that it doesn't bother you anymore. And all of a sudden it doesn't really bother you to kind of drift away from the Lord Jesus Christ or even say, well, you know, well, yeah. there's a reason they call it a falling away. Nobody wakes up one day really and goes, well, the blessings of God are great, but I just don't want to be blessed anymore. No. People go, well, God's great, but you know what, I want to... That, that looks kind of good. I know it's in the world, but it won't hurt a little bit because, I mean, the grace of God is overflowing. But I'll just take a little bit of the world. Over. You know what? It's Tuesday. I I'm fine. Friday night, it's okay. But hey, <laughs> Sunday I'll be in church and God's grace will wash over me and I'll be renewed. Mm -hmm. The problem is there is a damage that is done yes. Yes. to the heart, to the yes. psyche, to the mind. Walls start to be built. Just like they built an impenetrable wall around the circle at Jericho. There's a reason they call them strongholds. There's a reason they call them putting walls up that isolate us and separate us. And first we start to put walls up that separate us from other people in the church. Well, if you knew how some of the people in the church act, believe me, I know how some of the people in the church act. And they give you a good reason to put a wall up. But the reality of the matter is when we put walls up, we start isolating ourselves. He is a God of relationship. We cannot fulfill His commandments outside a relationship. And once we put walls up, we cut off the relationship. And if we cut off the relationship with enough people, it's not long before we put a dome over the building and cut off the relationship with God. And we have fallen away. We have forfeited the earnest. We have surrendered the deposit. Let us so love one another that walls of separation and isolation cannot be built. Let us so love and honor one another that our hearts don't become hardened. Why do you think God hates gossip and lying in the church so very much? Because it burns people. It puts scabs on their heart. It hardens their heart. Why do you think God so despises the gossip and the backbiting in the religion, the religious attitudes, the religious spirits that get in the church that try to judge and separate and tear apart and divide. Because it sears the heart, the conscience. People become burned. They, Man, you talk to people that don't go to church anymore, that used to go to church, and I will guarantee you to a person, they will say, somebody mm -hmm. did something. Somebody said something. God is not driving people away from the church. People are driving people away from the church. Amen. And they're doing it with religious spirits. Yes. They're doing it with undoctrinal teaching. They're doing it because they've adulterized the gospel of Jesus Christ by mixing some stuff from the world in to try to make the gospel of Jesus Christ more attractive. Mm -hmm. Think about the irony of that statement. Blessed with all spiritual blessings, everything good heaven has to offer, overflowing grace, that even as a drug addict, an adulterer, a whore, a prostitute, a thief, a murderer, you can find the grace of God and be born again in a new life. You can hate yourself, get rid of that person, and become somebody likable. All of those things, and somehow we've got to put window dressing on that free offer to make it more attractive? Are we kidding ourselves? Really? We really need to dress up the gospel of Jesus Christ to make it look better. We, who can't even save or fix ourselves, we who can't even make ourselves look pretty, are going to dress up His gospel. What we do is we wind up making His gospel look more like our broken self and then can't figure out why it doesn't have the power to transform lives anymore. Oh, but then we could have some God-fearing, Holy Ghost-filled meetings where people get radically transformed by the power of God. Mm -hmm. By His presence. Yes. Not by the judgment of other believers or religious attitudes, but just the power and the love of God. Just, people are falling out, falling over. 
dance and rejoice and celebrate. Don't know what happened, but it happened. Oh, if we could be a people that celebrated a place that said, I don't know what happened, but it happened. Amen. Amen. Amen.